All right, well, uh, my name's Susan Williams. I'm a professor of history here at GRCC, so thank you all for coming to the panel today. And I'm really excited about it. Uh, our panel focus today is law and politics, and we have uh, Sterling Johnson from Central Michigan University, Jim Fister from Eastern Michigan University, and Christy Bartholomew from the University of Michigan at Flint. Um, so today they're going to each take about 20 minutes or so um, to, to present their papers, and then we'll leave question and answer, then have time for question and answers at the end there. Um, so first, we have the International Criminal Court, Prosecuting Africa by Sterling Johnson. First again, eh? Okay. Well, this, is, uh, this paper grows out of an experience I had this summer. I went to The Hague to take a summer school course on international criminal law, and there were several Africans there from Burundi and the DRC and uh, Kenya and uh, Uganda, and they, were, they, they objected. They, they raised a lot of questions and uh, actually challenged the legitimacy of the court and what it was doing in Africa. So it, it made me really, really start rethinking the role of the court in Africa. And this is a draft of some things, ideas I've come up with. Now that we have this uh, international criminal court, we've really crossed a, a major threshold uh, in terms of uh, setting norms and standards for the world and for for our political leaders and their responsibilities uh, to their citizens. So we have regional, hum hum regional human rights commissions and regional human rights courts, and they're playing an increasingly important role in uh, stopping arbitrary and illegal practices by political leaders in Europe, the Americas, and in Africa. So we have seen an increase in respect for norms, laws, and rules. And uh, the rule of law has become somewhat more indivisible. The reverse has also been true. Rel we know that relative minor violations of human rights are the building blocks for gross abuses later on if, if we let impunity reign. One of the concerns that, the Afri that these African lawyers and lots of lawyer African legal scholars and legal practitioners have is the question that they feel they're being picked on, that Africa's being picked on. Why has the ICC seemingly focused on Africa? Uh, that's one question. Does the International Criminal Court activity in, re in Africa represent world peace through law as critics of the uh, prosecutor's office charge? Or is it some imposition of a new type of neo-imperialist legal hegemony by the West on Africa? Uh, another question is, can these prosecutions serve as a preemptive political deterrent? And exactly whom should be indicted and arrested when we start talking about these atrocities and violations of uh, ge well, genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Um, what are the limits of the ICC uh, in, in Africa? Are there any limits that can be placed on them? Uh, so if we look at the DRC, Congo, Kenya, Liberia, Sudan, Uganda, there are leaders in each of these countries who are facing ICC prosecution. Um, and but on a larger scale, we can't just say these leaders are responsible. We going to have to start looking at some corporations who facilitate this, this type of behavior. Uh, for example, uh, the National Foreign Trade Council, uh, a U.S. business lobbying lobbyist group, is very much uh, complicit here. They complain that, the, that, this, that, this, uh, that this, we have this list of, t of companies, and they're on it. This, they're, as a corporation lobbyist, they're on it. And, um, they are particularly involved in the Sudan and doing business in the Sudan. So if we're going to go after Omar al-Bashir, perhaps we should go after these economic interests in the United States that encourage Bashir to behave this way. You know, as you know, they're supposed to have a, a referendum very soon on whether the South will succeed. How will the National uh, Trade Council respond to this? We can also look at the government of China uh, which is, you know, has three arms manufacturers in, in, in Khartoum. So perhaps the Chinese are equally complicit. So where do you draw the line? Whom do you prosecute? Uh, there's been a decline in faith and democracy in some of these African states. And if we look, for example, uh, they, they take a poll. There's this Afrobarometer out of Michigan State. They took a poll of citizens in several African states, and they asked, many questions, one of which is how many of the following people do you think are involved in corruption or haven't you heard of much about them? And when you ask specifically about judges and magistrates, about 32 percent 
of the people of Benin think that most of their j judges are corrupt. 7.9% in Botswana, Burkina Faso, 17%, Cabo Verde, 13%, Kenya, 27% of the people think their magistrates are corrupt. In Liberia, 26% think their magistrates are corrupt. In Ma uh, Mali, 24%, uh, Madagascar, 28%, Nigeria, 28%, Senegal, 27%, South Africa, 22%, 20% in Tanzania, 28% in Uganda, 20% of Zambians, 21% of Zimbabweans think their magistrates and judicial systems are corrupt, so they don't have enough confidence in their own judicial systems. Does this mean that they would welcome, welcome the ICC? Uh, we have these rules of complementarity in the Rome Statute that take place so that w if prosecutions can't take place domestically, then the ICC can come in and prosecute. Uh, so you can see where there is increased, there may be increased loyalty to the ICC and more confidence in the ICC than in their own national judicial systems. Uh, when we look at Africa, of course, there, we see a mix of, of legal systems that date back uh, primarily to the colonial era, but there was always a, a conflict, well, always been long, for centuries there's been this, this uh, mixed systems of Islamic law and traditional African law, but when we uh, look at across the board, we have several civilist system, mixed systems, and most African p political systems when it comes to law have mixed uh, judicial traditions. What Ali Mazrui taught called the triple heritage of Western law, traditional law, and Islamic Sharia law. Well, the Office of the Prosecutor, which is largely responsible for initiating these indictments and uh, issuing arrest warrants, uh, set out some goals in, in 2006. Uh, they wanted to conduct four to six investigations between 2006 and 2009 just to get the ball rolling in Africa. And this goal, these goals were based on three factors. The information that they had to, first they had to collect sufficient information about whom uh, whom these alleged criminals were and which crimes fell under their jurisdiction. Then they had to ask the question about the gravity of the threshold for, it, uh, for initiating investigations, Wh which ones can we really focus on because they have limited, uh, limited resources. And then the time limit, the duration of these investigations. They knew that they couldn't be protracted uh, because you know, look, you know, they might end up like the Slobodan Milosevic trial, and, and people just get tired, or the guy dies, and uh, you know, no justice. People feel there was no justice served. Under Articles 58, 53, I'm sorry, under Article 53 and Rule 48 of the Rome Statute, the Office of the Prosecutor is required to assess the interests of the victims. This means this can get quite expensive. The victims have to be tele televised, or tr their transmission, their testimony has been transmitted, or m many times they just but into The Hague itself, and so uh, timeliness becomes a real factor. It took the Office of the Prosecutor about 10 months to, uh, to file the arrest warrants against the Ugandan criminals known as the Lord's Resistance Army, uh, Joseph Kony, Vincenati, Okoro Diambo, Dominic Ongwen. These, uh, you know, most of them have been arrested or indicted. Uh, it took them about 18 months to a list arrest warrants for uh, some of the people in the DRC. And in April 2007, there were, uh, there were warrants issued for uh, the Sudanese uh, interior minister uh, and the alleged leader of the Janjaweed -Jean militia, including Omar al-Bashir, the president, who said essentially that, well, he doesn't even recognize the jurisdiction of the court. But that's the same thing Slobodan Milosevic said. And Carla Del Ponte said, well, you're sitting here in the trial, and you know, we got you. It's, you know, habeas corpus, you're, you know, you're, you're going to be prosecuted. And then he dies. So the qualities of, pro of these prosecutions uh, are, are largely will largely be determined by the length of these trials. Um, for Uganda, uh, it depends on how long it takes to even catch capture these people. And of course, in Uganda and in the DRC, there's the problem of getting these, getting them to come, to getting the ones, the camp commanders in the field to surrender themselves. And they're playing a very dangerous game because many of them are saying, well, we will, if, if you give us immunity from prosecution, we'll lay down our arms 
and uh, let you, you know, have a, p a peace agreement. But we're, if you're going to prosecute us, why should we lay down our arms? This is the same position of many of the Sudanese uh, criminals. Article 16 of the of the uh, of the, of the UN Security Council uh, says that proceedings can be postponed for a year. These uh, the Security Council has this clause in the Rome Statute that they can postpone the proceedings for a year. Many people say that might be a good thing. Uh, gives these criminals a chance to think about it a little longer. But once again, you're weighing timeliness. Time, time becomes a real vari variable here. The victims in the meantime are suffering, the atrocities increase. So the true intentions of, you know, particularly, the, and you look at a group like the Lord's Resistance Army, you don't know what their intentions are. How do you know that they're going to uh, come to lay down their arms and come to the peace table? You really, you know, you, they really, they really can't be trusted. And now you have these criminals essentially dictating to the Security Council and to the International Criminal Court, and that's not good uh, for international justice at all. The uh, the amnesty was laid on the table for the criminals in Uganda, uh, but. You know, we have to think about how fair is this amnesty? We're only going after the top commanders, and a, a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the perpetrators will go unpunished. And so, when you when you start thinking about the communal level of African politics, as in the case of Rwanda, for example, do you really want the people who murdered your family to just get a slap on the wrist, how much healing and political uh, stability does that bring? In the eyes of the local people, who, the victims, this is, a, this, this is equal to impunity and uh, essentially not being punished at all. The Security Council uh, has, of course, uh, been active in Darfur, but no one wanted to really call it a genocide. The Office of the Prosecutor has alleged that the Darfur Security Desk uh, was in, responsible for finding and arming the Janjaweed militia, inciting them to carry out these attacks, issuing orders for the militia and armed forces to victimize the civilian population through mass rapes, torture, killings, lootings, and essentially crimes against humanity. And uh, 18 months after these OTP prosecutors, OTP issued these indictments, the Bashir regime was basically saying, you have no jurisdiction, and what are you going to do about it, Security Council? And the Security Council refused to really respond. They just let it, they just let uh, uh, Khartoum get off the hook. Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, it says, well, it's binding on the states to help bring this man to justice. So if he travels anywhere, he should have been arrested. Well, Bashir, Bashir's gone to other African countries. He was even uh, taunted to be the head of the African Union, but uh, no one wants to arrest him. So now it makes the leaders of all the other African states complicit in this uh, disrespect for the newly established course, and it also gives them free reign to continue atrocities in their own states and not be afraid of punishment. Uh, you know, let me see, let me kind of wrap this up here. You probably are familiar with the situation in the Congo. Recently they found, you know, thousands of women have been raped, many of them raped by DRC troops. Uh, the Security Council can be as complicit here. They didn't really do anything. They didn't try to enforce uh, the law not to punish, didn't want to punish these people. Uh, so the ICC and the Security Council had tension between them when the Rome Statute was being drafted because it was a fear that the Security Council would not really take the court as seriously in terms of uh, its, its universal mandate. That perhaps it would, the Security Council politicized the International Criminal Court, which is one of the reasons we're, you know, we're not members of it yet even though they made all kind of concessions uh, to the Bush administration 
Bush refused to sign. And well, it seems that other nations have been following our suit and basically setting up preconditions for cooperating with this court. And um, these 21,000 peacekeeping forces and the uh, soldiers in the Congo uh, under pressure from Kabila basically um, ignored their professionalism as soldiers and were engaged in, in some of these atrocities. And uh, uh, Kabila's not going to do anything. The Africans that I uh, was uh, studying with this summer uh, had the idea that perhaps they were being singled out, their continent was being singled out. The Rome Statute doesn't require any type of regional balance. But in their eyes, they think, well, okay, you've made so many prosecutions in, in, in Europe, and now you're going to have to do so many prosecutions in Africa just to make it look good. And uh, they think that the money, that they think is a gross waste of money, uh, that perhaps all of this money spent on prosecutions could be spent on training lawyers, on building their infrastructure, that most of these criminals and criminal behavior are a function of the poverty and the manipulation of poverty and people's sentiments. And uh, so they're going to have to really kind of bridge the gap between The Hague and these local villages. They're going to have to probably have more of what they refer to as in situ on the scene courts rather than flying people around. They're going to have to build up the legal infrastructure in each one of these African countries. The, you, it's one thing for villages to be able to look to The Hague and see justice there, and, but, that re, but that's, that's too remote. They need primarily to be able to see that their own courts are prosecuting these people, and their own courts to prosecute these people will have to arrest them, and that means they have to build up their police forces. Most of the police forces in these African countries are very, very, very corrupt. And so, if, and, and this data on the corruption of judges and man, magistrates mm -hmm. is dwarfed by the, the, by the numbers and the negative numbers of perceptions of the police. And of course, if the police are involved in rape and killing, uh, it just gets very nasty. And there's lots of work to be done. And I think uh, there's this trans Center for Transitional Justice basically says we need an alternative to the ICC, and that is the transitional justice courts. But th that means really mass education campaigns in all these countries of a whole, gener of a whole new generation of teachers. And you have to build a human infrastructure. So the ICC really has its work cut out for it. And at the bottom line, it's, uh, the, the politics of it are cr critical, but the African perceptions of the court must be changed. And uh, I think, no, it's just a lot, we've got a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Jim Bisper from Eastern Michigan University uh, with his paper, Marbury versus Madison in comparison to other cases in 1803. I have a handout here. The uh, case of Marbury versus Madison, of course, is thought of as the uh, perhaps the most important Supreme Court case in constitutional law, and uh, certainly the first usually the first case one sees in a constitutional law case book. Uh, I want to, wanted to put it in context with the other cases of 1803 um, and to see whether it was really a departure and activism uh, from the other cases. Uh, was it a political move on the part of uh, John Marshall or was it simply another case? It happened to be a very big case, but nonetheless very similar in methodology to the others. And so uh, I started this research. Uh, Marbury versus Madison has had a reputation today of being an activist case. Uh, the well-known political scientist uh, James McGregor Burns, I don't know if some of you used the Burns and Peldison. I'm, I started teaching American government in 67, and Burns and Feldes, and well, here he is. He has a book, 
attacking the court, 2009. See, he must be quite elderly. <laughs> but he says the following. He says, John Marshall was wrong. Now, that you have to have some status to say that yes. in the uh, legal field. <laughs> he said, and of course, he's, par he's quoting the famous line in Marbury versus Madison. He says, it is emphatically the province and duty of the American people not the nine justices of the, the United States Supreme Court to say what the uh, Constitution is. Now, interestingly, Marshall said what the law is. He didn't say what the Constitution is. And that's not going to be a very important difference. Uh, from this quote, and there are many others in the same vein, one might conclude that Marshall, uh, to quote the, or allude to the famous political philosopher from Alaska, uh, went rogue in Marbury versus Madison, cleverly avoiding a confrontation with President Jefferson, but establishing judicial review, a political power to aggressively intrude upon the political organs of government. I think many, we, we look back on the case, and I think sometimes we see it that way. A purpose of my research here is to test the null hypothesis that Marbury was not unlike other cases of the February 1803 term of the Supreme Court uh, and its basic methodology. It was a big case which created what Marshall called a delicate situation. But a big case is not necessarily a difficult one or one demanding an activist methodology, as uh, Justice Scalia mentioned in a recent uh, interview with, uh, with C-SPAN. I look here at Marbury in the context of his time with an unknown future. Instead of looking currently now back, look at it from when it was, uh, how they looked at the world. Uh, where Ed Edward Cook, and William Blackstone, the great legal theorists of English legal tradition, were very much on Marshall's mind. I tentatively conclude that because uh, that the section to of Marbury to which Burns alludes was not very activist when put into context. That in Marshall, in, in Marbury, Marshall pursued very much a textualist approach to legal materials and with them used standard common law techniques. And so I would conclude it was a conservative decision. In particular, we're going to be talking about the last part of Marbury versus Madison, which is the famous part on judicial review. But unlike the other cases of 1803, Marbury, in Marbury, Marshall did enter the more political realm of political theory. I believe these forays into political analysis were unnecessary, dicta, perhaps uh, tempting. Maybe they were even playfully mischievous, one, which is one definition of rogue. Uh, perhaps at worst we can say that in Marbury, Marshall was in part practicing political science without a license. <laughs> uh, now the domain I have here in this, uh, which I finished quoting, I haven't completed all the cases um, in 1803. You can see in table one. Um, and uh, there is a variety of technical cases. This has taken quite a bit of time to study. I practiced law for several years and I, th I thought, well, I can look at these early cases and basically understand what was going on. I can say that the law they dealt with in those days was at least as complicated as ours, if not more so. And you can see from table one, you have the Marbury case uh, divided into three to four parts. Then uh, Clark versus Young, there's an endorsement on a note. Where there's a drawer of the notes in solvent. Uh, there's a case, interesting one, uh, appellate jurisdiction of the court, a contract case on a ship going to uh, Europe and what happens when the British capture it and so on. Uh, probate, uh, another endorsement on a note and so on. It's very complicated stuff. Um, 
the model of methodology I use, judicial methodology, I have in Table 2. Um, what I have is an 18-point scale of uh, methods from low to high. And then I collapse those categories to an ordinal scale uh, from preliminaries, basically stating facts and what happened below, to textual analysis. And textual analysis, I made use of St uh, Justice Stephen Breyer's uh, uh, model of uh, methodology in his book, Active Liberty, uh, a couple of years ago, where he speaks of different types of uh, methods that justices use. And then I have some, uh, I have the common law, and then above that would be what I would call the active category, the more political category. And what I do is uh, code each paragraph according to an 18, the 18 point scale. Each paragraph gets at least one code, and it can get more than one if there's more than what one, what I call thought points in the paragraph. The basic unit analysis uh, in the uh, study is the thought point uh, with each paragraph uh, considers having at least one. If you look at the overall view of the findings on table three, uh, it shows cases in terms of the ordinal categories. We can see there is no activism in the non marabari cases. The common law methods are dominant in most of the cases. In those cases where it is not, more conservative methods dominate, such as textual analysis. In a couple of cases, preliminary matters dominated. Notice that the most famous part of Marbury on judicial review, that would be Marbury 4, Activism is more prominent than in any other case. But what I think is very interesting, but most important, textual analysis is the most prominent, even more so than in the common law, uh, than the common law methods. And textual analysis in this famous part of Marbury, Marbury for her, is more prominent than it is in most other cases. So we're Marshall has seemed to be the most activist, and he is more political here. He's also very highly textualist in his analysis. And it appears that Marshall relied on the text here in this difficult case. Um, uh, table four shows the uh, scale of cases with substantial opinions. Uh, not all the cases had substantial opinions. But those that had uh, 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 substantial opinion, I put here, and you can see the 18-point uh, scale used regarding that. Um, regarding Marbury 4, the activism codings fall mostly in the policy or political science category, followed by the practical implications or consequences category. Uh, the consequences category is one which uh, Stephen Breyer emphasized that he likes to follow, a little more activist approach. Marshall seems to have clearly entered the realm of political science here, at least briefly. An analysis of the lines of the case, though, shows that 68.8% of these codings were done in only 33.7% of the case. So we kind of just put it in a small part of it. In the dominant area of textual analysis, the most heavily loaded category is textual language, which is your most conservative approach. So it's looking at the words. But it's also important he looked at textual consequences, uh, that parts of the Constitution would have no meaning if the congressional statutes were to prevail over the Constitution. Very interestingly for me in Table 4 is that the use of precedence, uh, here what I call precedent reliance, or PR, is lightly loaded where it is found. And often it is not found. Usually we think of precedent as the workhorse of our legal system. Uh, 
And certainly the uh, lawyers that argued before Marshall and the, and the court did cite precedent. But uh, for some reason, and I want to look into this further, they didn't, the court didn't use much citation to precedent uh, in these opinions. Now let's look, look quickly here at that famous paragraph that uh, Burns uh, spoke of. And we, since you have the handout, I, we could read it together. Um, Marshall writes, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Those who apply the rule to particular cases must of necessity expound and interpret that rule. If two laws conflict with each other, the courts must decide the operation of each. Now what this is is the choice of law problem common to virtually all courts. Marbury was there in front of the court asking the court to do something. Note in the above part that I quoted the word necessity. Marshall had to determine whether the court had jurisdiction to hear the case. The statute said yes, the Constitution said no. Here I think if I could say it, James McGregor Burns is wrong. Marshall is not determining what the Constitution is, but which of two uh, contradictory laws will be applied in this case before the court when there's a conflict between them. He must do this. Or will the normal rule apply that the last law in time prevails? Well, in this case, he answered no, because uh, for various reasons he gave, the Constitution is the higher law. And I might add the main reason he gave is textual, which we'll see in a minute here. Thus, it was largely textual analysis, including the intent of those who drafted the Constitution, which is uh, at the heart of things here. It's very importantly that Marshall concludes Barbary IV here, the important part for uh, the commentators, in a kind of an understatement. Again, I think he has a sense of humor. Uh, by the legal implications of textual language of the Supremacy Clause, Article 6, Paragraph 2. Marshall writes, it is also not entirely unworthy of observation that in declaring what shall be the supreme law of the land, the Constitution itself is first mentioned and not the laws of the United States generally, but those only which have which shall be made in pursuance of the Constitution have that rank. So there's your answer. So he didn't really have to go into the political analysis and some of the broader statements he made. He immediately continues in recognition of the textual language. This is right at the end of the opinion. Thus the particular phraseology of the Constitution of the United States confirms and strengthens the principle supposed to be essential to all written constitutions that a law repugnant to the Constitution is void. So I think the whole thing, this is based on textual analysis. Justice Stephen Breyer in his recent book uh, just this year emphasizes the last line of Marshall's opinion, which is follows what I've just uh, quoted here. Breyer emphasizes that, uh, he says, the court, that courts, as well as other departments, are bound by that instrument. That's the line that Marshall wrote, the last line of the case, that courts, as well as other departments, are bound by that instrument of the Constitution. Breyer writes, Consider, too, what Marshall did not do in Marbury. He did not decide that the court had an exclusive power to interpret the Constitution or a power superior to the other branches. So in other words, I conclude on this issue that the part of Marbury, which is, gets a lot of people excited, is about judicial activism here. The court was deciding for itself a choice of law problem. 
which it had to do because it had a case before it. Marshall largely used textual analysis and legal conceptualization to do this. But perhaps he did on this occasion unnecessarily enter into the realm of political analysis. And he did probably practice political science without a license, but that it was harmless, harmless error. He may have had no idea that the future would look back on his political statements <laughs> to, to see this as something maybe more than he intended. So. Thank you very much. Um, our final paper today is by Christy Bartholomew from University of Michigan Flint, and it's entitled, The Person of One's Choice from Privacy to Separate but Equal, A Constitutional Argument for the Legalization of Same-Sex Marriage. Um, Article 3 of the United States Constitution states the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in which such inferior courts such as the Congress may from time to time ordain or establish. The judicial power shall extend all cases in law and equity. Arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States and treaties made or which shall be made under their authority. What I've done is I've compiled uh, several cases that have established precedent over time. Some are state cases and some are uh, uh, U.S. Supreme Court cases um, that support what appears to be a sort of evolutionary process towards no longer denying rights but expanding rights um, under the Constitution. Um, the importance of the essay is to show that there's evidence that the Constitution has historically righted pre previous wrongs rather than acting as a document by which discrimination is upheld or exacerbated. Some of the examples that, that I cite are um, giving rights to uh, uh, women to vote and the abolishment of slavery. Um, one of the things that I noticed, and I'm sure all of us have noticed um, throughout recent history there have been uh, accusations by elected officials, specifically uh, former Republican President George W. Bush, that activist judges mm -hmm. are making decisions against the will of the people. And the only way to stop the hostile takeover of traditional marriage is to amend the United States Constitution. On four occasions in 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, in 2008, legislation was introduced and the federal marriage amendment failed. Uh, so the topic of same-sex marriage has been politically and socially controversial and has inspired a range of conflict over the last 20 years that has specifically been pre uh, prevalent during uh, Republican campaigns for office. So obviously my topic is the legalization of same-sex marriage in the United States. So my question is, is there evidence based on the United States Constitution as well as established precedent, uh, both on the state and federal level that could find the denial of civil marriage to same-sex couples unconstitutional? I argue that there is evidence that the, the denial of same-sex marriage is unconstitutional. The evidence that I use to support this, uh, as I said, are um, cases uh, that have established president, um, scholars, scholarly sources, and the, my approach to this was chronological um, because obviously as time has passed, that's how our presidents get established, one piggybacking upon the other. Um, so what I've done is I've looked at the First Amendment, the established clause of the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, uh, the Fifth Amendment, and finally the due process and equal protection afforded by the Fourteenth Amendment. So the counter argument that uh, we've all experienced in the press and in courts and things has been, uh, uh, as I said, leveled by uh, past politicians running for office trying to use um, same-sex couples as uh, a, a weapon um, to sway their uh, constituents one way or the other or have been used by um, a variety of religious figures, uh, obviously, to get their point across. Um, so the, the first case that I would like to start out with is one actually from 1948. It's from the California Supreme Court and the name of the case is Perez versus Sharp. And it was actually um, an interracial couple who wanted to get married and their state constitution said it was illegal. And 
uh, the argument was based on the violation of the 14th Amendment, and this case uh, became a footnote in Loving v. Virginia. So, and in, like I said, I was, I'm doing this chronologically, so we're going to skip ahead to Loving v. Virginia. Um, one of the things that I thought was really significant shortly before Mildred uh, Loving died was she actually spoke out in support of same-sex marriage because of the discrimination that she had faced trying to marry the person that she loved. Um, be before I forget, one of the things that was significant about the Perez versus Sharp case is that the, the main focus throughout the case, and it was reiterated over and over through the case, was that one person should be able to marry the other person of one's choice. It wasn't a matter of being uh, religiously sanctioned or civilly sanctioned. It was a matter of you know two people, whether they're um, of the same religion or of the same race or demographics or class, it was that they ought to have the choice to marry whoever it is that they want. And I'm sure most everyone here is familiar with Loving Virginia. Um, of course, they said that uh, they try to pr prohibit uh, interracial marriages solely on the basis of racial classifications, and it was found that it violated the 14th Amendment under uh, equal protection as well as the due process clause. And of course, to piggyback upon it, uh, We'll uh, continue on to Griswold versus Connecticut, but one of the things I also found significant about this case is that one of the footnotes in the case of Loving v. Virginia was a case that stems back to 1888. It was Menard versus Hill. And this case has suggested that it has recognized marriage as creating the most important relation in life and it's integrally linked to the morals and civilization of people. So again, my argument is by denying the person of one's choice the ability to, to legally marry seems to go against civilization. Um, like I said, as uh, I'll continue, uh, the, the, the Griswold versus Connecticut case, I'm sure most, of course, we're all political scientists here, we're familiar with. Um, what I did was, as I analyzed these cases, I looked at some of the things that the deciding uh, judges said. And, and something that, that stood out to me in this was, um, the question was, the very idea, it was a quote, the very idea is repulsive to the notion of privacy surrounding the marriage relationship, because this case clearly deals with privacy. Um, and in the majority opinion, it was said, marriage is the coming together for better or worse, hopefully enduring in the intimate, and intimate to the degree of being sacred. It is an association that promotes a way of life, not causes a harmony in living, not political faiths, a bilateral loyalty, not commercial or social projects. So again, solidifying the idea that exactly the way we look at civil marriage now, it's basically a contract between two people. You know, there's, if you choose to go someplace and, and have your um, relationship recognized by the religion that you choose to associate with, that's fantastic. But the idea that marriage is sanctioned by and recognized by the state by which you live in, and then of course further on into, um, you can go anywhere and get married and you can go anywhere and get divorced. It doesn't really matter. Um, getting off on a rant. <laughs> um, the, the next case that I addressed was Eisenstadt versus Baird, and that was in 1972. Um, this case was one that addressed Griswold versus Connecticut and extended its holding to unmarried couples the right of privacy. This case was significant because it also is one that is going to piggyback on to Bowers versus Hardwick, which we know wasn't successful, so to speak, as far as offering um, rights until um, uh, 2003 with Lawrence. Um, this case was argued that it was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause, and it was decided that people, it just solidified the right to privacy. 
the next case that I have is Bowers versus Hardwick, which uh, I'm sure we've all heard of too. Um, this case, I, I found a, a difficult case to understand because what was found to be an anti-sodomy law that was so narrowly focused um, on homosexuals, it was almost as if, okay, you can come knock on someone of the same sex's door and arrest them, yet if heterosexual couples are partaking in the same sort of activity, that they're omitted from prosecution, so to speak. Uh, that that case was a, a difficult one for me to to analyze just because it, the the is so blatantly hypocritical. Um, and the next case was Romer versus Evans, um, and this was uh, in 1996, but it actually started in 1992. Uh, it was an amendment to the Colorado Constitution that prevented. Uh, protected status under the law for homosexuals or bisexuals, and it was struck down because it was not r uh, uh, rationally related to a uh, legitimate state interest. Uh, the Supreme Court of Colorado affirmed uh, Roy Romer, of, uh, he was the governor of Colorado, would appeal it to the Supreme Court. And then, of course, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned a state, constitu a state constitutional amendment that prohibited uh, gay citizens from attaining special legal protections from state and local government. And then the court, in turn, invalidated the amendment because its scope exceeded the rational relations to um, as the asserted legitimate state interests. So here we are now, we're in 2003. Now, this case is clearly one of the most significant president setting cases that there's been uh, in relation to uh, same-sex marriage or uh, same-sex protection. Um, so the, the case basically uh, involved a statute um, making it a crime for two persons of the same sex to engage in certain intimate sexual conduct. The doctrine of substantive due process had been established in rulings to protect the right to marital privacy and non-procreative sex within marriage to consume pornography in the home for unmarried individuals to engage in private non-procreative sex and for a woman to terminate her pregnancy. Uh, John Geddes Lawrence and Tyrone Garner were arrested in their home for violating the Texas sodomy law which said that two persons of the same sex are forbidden to engage in certain sexual uh, intimate sexual conduct. This case further solidified the right to privacy as it was found to be unconstitutional. Um, and it established a precedent that ex extended uh, the right for same-sex couples. Um, one of the, the uh, interesting statements that was found within, that I found within the um, uh, decision was that Justice Kennedy stated very specifically that, pri that it's private conduct and that it is not harmful to others, so therefore there should be no relation to, for it to be illegal. Uh, same way with uh, the consumption of pornography. Uh, as long as it's not hurting anyone else, it's nobody's business, basically. Um, so, one of the cases that I've been following recently, and you'll have to excuse my lack of organization because uh, these are fairly recent, um, the, the Gill case in Massachusetts. Um, this case it actually stands to be a very significant case also for the LGBT community and for uh, uh, the rights of individuals that are actually married. Um, this case actually deals with uh, the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. Um, it's targeting the denial of certain federal rights and protections to same-sex couples in Massachusetts. It was filed in the district court in Boston and it addresses uh, section three, which is to deny spousal protections and social security, federal income tax, federal employees and retirees benefits, and in the issuance of passports. Um, the case actually was heard 
this case started out on the 3rd of March in 2009 and was recently uh, heard in July, uh, this, this past July. And the, the judge, the U.S. District Judge, his name is Joseph L. Toro, ruled that Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act is unconstitutional with respect to the claims of the seven uh, uh, plaintiffs that brought uh, the, the case. It says that this act violates the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution, and Congress undertook this, cons this classification for one purpose that lies entirely outside the legislative bounds to disadvantage a group of which it disapproves in such a classification the Constitution clearly will not permit. This was, this was the, the decision that the, that the judge found. Um, and interestingly enough, that was decided on the 10th and by uh, the 2nd of October, uh, the United States Department of Justice responded by filing a motion of appeal. So this case indeed is gonna end up before our Supreme Court. Um, and the, the other case, of course, that's going on is Perry versus Schwarzenegger. This case, of course, is, is very interesting. It's relating to Prop 8. And, um, of course, it was a, a, an anti-gay, anti-marriage uh, ballot proposal in California to eliminate same-sex couples the right to marry. Um, one of the questions now, of course, we know how that ended up. Uh, one of the questions now is whether or not uh, the case... Um, uh, whether or not the case has legal standing. Um, the, the justice, his name's uh, Chief Justice Vaughn Walker, uh, in his decision said the moral disapproval alone is an improper basis on which to deny rights to gays and lesbians. The evidence shows conclusively that same-sex couples are inferior to opposite-sex couples because Proposition 8 is unconstitutional under both due process and equal protection clause, the court enters an entry of judgment permanently enjoining its enforcement, uh, prohibiting the official defendants from applying or enforcing Prop 8, and directly the official de uh, defendants that all persons under their control or supervision shall not apply or enforce Prop 8. Uh, there's been a stay, the stay was lifted, it was appealed, and at, at this point, um, the governor who has gone back and forth, Governor Schwarzenegger has gone back and forth initially while he was running, he said for governor, he said he would support it. Then he flipped and said that he wouldn't. And then he said that if the legislature could pass it, uh, he would support it then, but then he vetoed it. And now we're to the point where it's going to also, it appears, be appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. but. Both he and Attorney General Brown have said they are not going to pursue it. Uh, one of the questions that they're concerned about now is uh, they it says now that the case is being appealed in the Ninth Circuit, some question whether the non-governmental group, which are the people that brought about the argument, um, could show harm to themselves and meet other requirements of standing, which has ha been highlighted by the appellate judge's request. It is obvious that they think there's a genuine issue of whether the Prop 8 backers have a legal right, um, but they're, they're questioning whether or not there's actually been harm to have this case go forward. Um, sorry, my stuff's a little unorganized. Um, so those are the cases that I have discovered that have established precedent that have uh, expanded rights, expanded rights for uh, interracial couples, have expanded uh, privacy rights, um, afforded due process. Um, by, by, by precedent, these cases, in, in my opinion, seem to support rather than deny the legalization. So the evidence that I had gathered that were counter to my argument, um, one of the first uh, counter arguments that I had discovered, of course, is religion. Now, the First Amendment prohibits the making of any law respecting an establishment of religion, impeding the free exercises of religion, infringing on the freedom of speech, infringing 
on the freedom of press, interfering with the right to peaceable assembly or prohibiting the petition for a government, governmental redress of grievances. More specifically, the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment prohibits the establishment of a national, national religion by the Congress or the preference of one religion over another, non-religion over religion, or religion over a non-religion. Uh, one of the, the uh, quotes that I had found was by um, Reverend A. Hunter, who is a United Methodist minister. Um, he was quoted by the Atlantic Journal Constitution in uh, July of 2007 that, quote unquote, the Bible and Jesus defined marriage as between one man and one woman. The church cannot condone or bless same-sex marriages because this stands in opposition to scripture or our tradition. The Bible and Jesus may say many important things about love and family, but neither defines marriage between one man and one woman explicitly. Um, something I found interesting while I was doing my research as well is that uh, Abraham of the Old Testament cheated on Sarah when she found out she was infertile. And the Apostle Paul regarded marriage as an act of last resort for those who are unable to contain their animal lust. I never heard of that. Yeah. So during the, the Prop 8 argument, they brought in some, uh, uh, they brought in a legal sc or a scholar who um, uh, her, uh, le her expertise was marriage historically, and her name's Nancy Cott. And in her research, she found that marriage has never been universally, designed, universally defined as a union of one man and one woman, and that legal or that religion has never had any bearing on the legality of marriage. Marriage has been historically used punitively to, dis, to demean or disfavor groups, and uh, how legally enshrined gender roles in marriage had been disestablished during the 20th century and how the changes of the institutions of marriage have mainly involved the shedding of inequalities which strengthen marriage. Marriage is a civil contract offering practical benefits to both partners, contractual rights having to do with taxes, insurance, and the care and custody of children. So visitation, and, oh, as well as visitation rights and inheritance. Religious marriage is a commitment of both partners before God in love, honor and cherish each in sickness and in health for richer, poorer in accordance to God will. This is her quote and this is what she found historically in relation to marriage. So then the flip side of that is the judicial activism that, that the judges have been accused of. So in, 30, in 36 states, courts did not hear same -sex, a same-sex marriage case between January 1990 and December of 2005. Notwithstanding the legal actions or popular initiatives of same-sex marriage or civil unions, which may have occurred in those 36 states, the courts in those states did not act at all on the issuer. In the other 14 where litigants filed same-sex cl marriage claims, the courts heard their cases. In seven of those 14, the state courts initially faced the same-sex marriage cases in the absence of any expression from the legislature. That's right, the legislature said had nothing to do with it. <laughs> uh, the state legislature, legislature had yet to act in any way on this issue. These statistics show clearly that the courts have acted repeatedly only when the legislature, who is supposed to be the voice and or will of the people, has remained silent, refuting the implied judicial activism put forth by several conservative groups and of course championed by our last president, George Bush. Um, so in conclusion, because I've run over a little bit, uh, to deny same-sex couples civil marriage is unconstitutional. Judges would not have to make the difficult decisions if the legislature acted on behalf of the people and created fair laws. And finally, marriage is not as religious as one may think and neither Jesus nor the Bible have an opinion regarding same-sex marriage. The political implications are as long as there is discrimination against any segment of the people, which we've witnessed with interracial marriages and such, um, that our entire constitutional system is compromised. 
All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have some time for questions. Does anybody have a question for any of our panelists? familiar with the ICC thank you I'm not real familiar with the ICC but explain the mechanism once someone is successfully prosecuted in court who handles uh, who who would imprison that person the in, in the United Nations this is usually an arrangement that can be worked out by the state there if if the state uh, let's take the uh, Lockerbie trial for example mm -hmm. where Femi and McGrahi go on trial. They work out a, a deal. Well, we'll prosecute, and uh, we'll prosecute in in The Hague, but you'll serve time in Scotland. Right? The crime had, the crime occurred in Scotland, and so they can work these arrangements out. Um, if the whole if the, if the state that, that has uh, subject matter jurisdiction refuses to prosecute, mm -hmm. then the person can be arrested, tried, and incarcerated at Schavenhagen in The Hague. Mm -hmm. However, if the court, say if we take the special court for Sierra Leone, where you, the ICC says, okay, you're willing to prosecute, we're gonna help you with the, the mechanism to prosecute, you can be tried, arrested, tried, and serve your sentence right there in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. uh, or if we take uh, the ICTAR and in uh, the, the ICTR, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which was set up in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. And so we try you, we, we, have, we have some trials, some of the people are tried in, in Rwanda itself, others, criminals were tried in Rwanda, in uh, Tanzania. Mm -hmm. uh, the leadership tried in Tanzania. They aren't going to be incarcerated in, in Tanzania. The underlings, the minions, mm -hmm. are be uh, get these Jakaka, the under the tree justice trials. These are the ones who really, you know, the victims say they might have gotten away with it, that there's some impunity. But uh, they'll serve brief sentences right there in Rwanda and can be released. So it depends on the relationship between that, that, the, that, the, that the subject matter jurisdiction state works out with The Hague. So it's quite flexible. I, I just want to ask you to put your crystal ball on for a minute. Mm -hmm. And what is your, uh, what do you think President, how President Obama, uh, do you see us signing on during his administration compared to, you know, what President Bush didn't do? He has given uh, the Justice Department and he's sent some, uh, some State Department people, he's told them to try and accommodate working with the court as much as possible. Uh, he's, we are, they are moving towards eventually uh, giving the United States signatory status. Uh, according to the American Society for International Law, um, they have advised, they, they, their advice is that we become a signatory and Obama has taken the advice of the American Society for International Law. So I envision that we will probably become. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question for um, Christy. When we're looking at the Lawrence and Garner versus Texas case, I think what was important was O'Connor, in her majority opinion, talked about how privacy is now this overarching um, understanding. With all those cases that you talked about, because when I teach, I, use, I talk about all those cases, and what, how I talk about it is every time there was a case about privacy ever since um, um, the 1963 case, mm -hmm. it expanded and expanded and expanded mm -hmm. and expanded. The, the um, broad constructionist idea about what privacy is. And so Lawrence and Garner was this idea where O'Connor had this line where she said privacy encompasses any decision or choice that has to do with personal dignity and autonomy. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so that's one of the reasons why the majority in that in that case decided that um, um, anti sodomy laws were unconstitutional. Right. Um, and so that now opened up this big wave of cases for the LGBT community to come forward and start pressing um, against these anti-gay laws that were on the books because any law that prevents you from marrying someone that, of your choice, I think balks of um, violating your personal dignity and autonomy, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that's also what the, what the lawyers in that Prop 8 case were talking about. They took, mm -hmm. they took that line from Lawrence and Garner and ran with it and said, if this is what the US Supreme Court now says is privacy, then there is no way in the state of California that we can 
uh, democratically take away somebody's choice of who they're going to marry, okay? And it looked like Judge Walker was agreeing with them. And so uh, it, I think after the Prop 8 has gone through all the channels, and there's still, I think it's the Ninth District, Ninth it's Circuit ninth. Court that's taken, mm -hmm. um, and after that it may go to the Supreme Court. But here's the thing, even when it goes to the Supreme Court, doesn't mean the Supreme Court's gonna take it. Exactly. And, and especially with these kind of cases, the, it's gonna be activist to the point that it might strike um, against the legitimacy of the court. And so this is the politics of the U.S. Supreme Court. You can right. appeal all the way, but it doesn't right. mean that they have to take it, right? Absolutely. And so, so I think that's what the LGBT community is so frustrated about, mm -hmm. um, that they do these cases. There's this case law that's there to protect them, but if the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't take it up, they are really stuck in based on which state they live in as to right. how many rights they're going to have. Right. I think right. we're going to see the same thing with the Gill case in Massachusetts. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's going to be exactly the same way. And as we see the new, new, relatively new people that are on the court in the last five years, right. um, I don't see that U.S. Supreme Court accepting any case that has to do with LGBT community. Because if they do and they follow precedent, they're going to have to vote in the favor of right. the legalization of same-sex marriage. Right. Or else they're going to have to go back to Lawrence and Garner and take away O'Connor's interpretation of privacy and redo it. And I don't see them doing that either. So I think it's gonna be a while until these cases actually come to the point where the US Supreme Court will take it on and, mm -hmm. and make the decision that follows precedent, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I, I agree 100%. I'll ask you my question. <laughs> so you guys all get a question. Actually, um, I agree with your analysis in the Marbury Four, you call it, where Marshall holds up the Constitution next to the Federal Judiciary Act of 1789 and um, says the con that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land and, and takes precedent over that. And I agree that that's textual analysis. But right then and there, if he was not acting um, in an activist sort of sense, shouldn't he have said, okay, we don't have jurisdiction to hear the case, so I'm not gonna hear it. Or why did he then take the next step to actually strike down the law um, if he wasn't acting in an activist sort of way? Well, I don't think he struck it down. I mean, I think he, what he did was dismiss the case. Um, I think a lot of times what he said, you have to kind of remember that he, uh, he had the lawyers arguing points before he, uh, the court. And so as this is the practice of appellate courts, they, the various gr grounds that the lawyers argue, the court wants to hit each one of them to answer. So I think that's one reason he went through a lot of different points. But I think what he simply did was say, uh, we, have to, we have a choice of law problem here between the Constitution and the statute. And we're looking at the words of both. Um, and I think he could easily, he easily handled it by going right to the last part of his op opinion, the last couple paragraphs saying, all you have to do is look at the textual language of Article 6, Paragraph 2, the Supremacy Clause. And it says the Constitution and then the laws made pursuant there to the Constitution. So the Constitution clearly textually in the Supremacy Clause is above the statute. And, that's, and so what he did is say we have to choose the Constitution over the statute, therefore we dismiss the case. He didn't, he didn't it's interesting, I don't think he used the word unconstitutional. Uh, now he did, in the opinion, talk about an earlier case that was uh, where they decided, the Supreme Court decided a statute was unconstitutional back in 1792. Uh, the Supreme Court decided a statute of Congress is unconstitutional. So I, I, th I think it's a myth that Marbury versus Madison established judicial review. I think we, judicial review goes back to Edward Cook of the, in the early 1600s, that uh, the king is under God and the law. Uh, and we had, and the states, uh, the legal system is the, uh, regularly exercise the supremacy of state constitutions over statutes. Uh, but uh, I think he, I, I really think the null hypothesis is this was just another case. It was a big case, it was a personal case because uh, he was confronting Jefferson and Jefferson was doing something really un, uh, kind of interesting. He was defying the clear language of appointments and refusing to deliver a commission. 
and it's a delicate situation because you're dealing with a, to me one of the most interesting parts of the case is the second part where he says, does Marbury have a remedy against such a high official as the president or the secretary of state? And he said, yes, in our system, everyone is under the law. To use the term, we're a nation of laws, not of men. I think that second issue is in some ways the most exciting one because it makes it clear that, uh, that uh, you could have an action against the Secretary of State or the President. But when it comes to, I think, an easier question is, is the big one here. The last one he's, is clearly textually inconsistent. And so he, he dismissed the case. That's all he did. I just find it ironic that he said that the court doesn't have original jurisdiction over writs of mandamus, over writs of mandamus for Article Three of the Constitution, but then he goes ahead and hears the case anyway. Well, he didn't. He he, uh, they had a um, original motion to show cause, and so it was on the books in 1801. It was originally taken, and there was a order to show cause against uh, uh, Madison and nothing was done, and the courts didn't meet in 1802 because they were, the new Congress was redoing a, a new st statute on the judiciary. And so this case had already been in the files, and I think they had to deal with it. But it was an interesting, you know, I think there's an interesting question as to whether you would have the last law on time prevail. You see, we're so used to judicial review, but Jefferson believed in the will of the people in the legislature. They got more of the French approach to democracy. So really it was an interesting, he, the question of whether uh, to follow the Constitution or, or the most recent law was an important question. So I think it was, it was a public paper, it was good to make a st statement about that. But then what he did was to revert to the actual textual language of I think Article Six, the Supremacy Clause, and say uh, as far as his choice was concerned, uh, he would, they would have to go with the, the Constitution. And it, it wasn't the writ of mandamus issue, it was who the party was, it was Marbury. So it was that if, uh, if you had a uh, foreign minister before you or a state, then he would have had original jurisdiction and even in a mandamus action. But it was the fact that you had, it, it was really so unusual because with the Judiciary Act, because uh, a state and a foreign minister are sovereigns. And so it was kind of an anomaly that the Judiciary Act would give the original jurisdiction to a non-sovereign, in a sense, just a, a person. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but really you can look at what he did very simply. And I think that, but what we've done is I think we've looked at that case a little bit like a Rorschach test or a projective test. We, we look back on it and put a lot of baggage on it. It's been interpreted by law professors and everybody, and of course it's by the courts, uh, as being maybe more than it was at the time. I have a question for Chris. Uh, there's a case in Dayton, Ohio, and the people of Dayton had taken a referendum on whether or not they would have open housing or not, and they, mm -hmm. you know, the referendum passed, and they said we won't have open housing, and it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, you, you know, you can't have a vote that where the people vote to violate the constitutional 14th Amendment rights of another group of people. Mm -hmm. Would that be part of the argument going forth here and with, the, with the proposition, the California proposition? It, it seems like it could yeah. potentially have an impact. Okay. I mean, it, as far as I'm concerned, and of course, I'm just a lowly undergrad. <laughs> Anything that establishes president, unless it's overturned, unless they explicitly disagree with it, as was mentioned in the, the Lawrence case, it seems like, you know, it's they all seem to piggyback upon one another, mm -hmm. expanding the rights based on the Constitution. You know, just just like um, it seems whenever the Constitution is amended, amended, it is amended to give rights yes. rather than deny rights. Mm -hmm. So you know, that that would that would be where I guess I would I would I would question whether or not that would all fit in together. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the name of that I, case. I, I, have a, mm -hmm. I have a question of you too. I think uh, 
maybe with Lawrence emphasizing liberty and you marry who you want to and the state would have to defer and the Christian Bible isn't a factor, I wonder if the Mormons should uh, start relooking at the old Reynolds case in the 19th century and say, well, why can't we have several wives? Well, has, isn't that sort of what's occurred in the, um, not in necessarily in the Mormons, but as far as the, the fundamentalist uh, sure. movement, where they've basically said that, you know, but we're going to follow our yeah. own guidelines. But I mean, actually, if you did allow gay marriage, and you say the government has a very small governmental interest, that's, to me, the key to the Lawrence case is, on homosexuality, is that the government couldn't show a substantial interest. Right, right. Well, maybe um, you could make the same case about polygamy. So it'd be interesting. I think that's where, um, as you develop your research, what I, I, th I think is outstanding so far, um, you might want to explore what would it take for the courts to recognize um, sexual orientation as a suspect class? Right. Because if it's elevated to mm -hmm. that classification, then the government has to prove that compelling state mm -hmm. interest to discriminate. That compelling state interest um, might be more provable in the case of denying Mormons the right to polyg polygamy more right. so than it would be denying gay couples the right to marry. So. Yeah, but, but also with that example, you're comparing apples with oranges. Um, it's one thing to say that one person should have the right to enter into a monogamous relationship, monogamous marriage. It's another thing to say to have the right to enter into a polygamous marriage. Those are That's comparing apples and oranges. And if you, if you read Scalia's dissent to Lawrence and Garner versus mm -hmm. Texas, which I have, mm -hmm. one of the reasons why he said that he did not want to find anti-sodomy laws unconstitutional is that he thought if we outlawed anti-sodomy laws, then the next thing on the book is going to be polygamy. Then the next thing after that is going to be bestiality. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, mm -hmm. it's the slippery slope argument that we don't give gay ri gay rights because if we give gays rights, then the polygamists are going to have rights and the bestiality people are going to have rights because you're conflating people who have sex with animals and polygamists in the same category mm -hmm. as gays, and that's a homophobic argument. There, that's apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. What gays are talking about is the right to marry one person just like heterosexual people ask for and are protected by law. It's a totally different argument to say that somebody should have the right to marry more than one person because heterosexuals and homosexuals don't have the right to do that. But, but the key factor is that you're saying the government doesn't have the power to say no. See, the government in California said no to gay marriage. So if the gay marriage wins, that shows the weakness of the government to determine its vision of marriage. Now, that's, so Scalia is on, you know, there's ecological consequences. So if there's a small governmental interest, then government can't say no to polygamy. Well, if we look at California's case with Prop 8, it was the court, it was the state court that found that it should be a legal right for gays to marry. And that's yeah. what opened up marriage for about you know five or six months where 18,000 yeah. couples got married. Mm -hmm. It was the court. Well, so we can say that the court, following as, part, yeah, as part yeah. of California government, did allow gay marriage. It was the voters in California that took it back and said they didn't want that to happen. Right. And so the issue is right here, is that a violation of the equal protection um, and privacy that was expanded under Lawrence and Garner v. Texas, or yeah, v. Texas. And Judge Walker agreed that it was a violation of how O'Connor defined what privacy was and what equal protection under the law was. And that, that's why the Prop 8 trial for the LGBT community is so important, mm -hmm. has national implications. One of the things that uh, I, I did address and wasn't able to articulate, obviously, I, the paper was 28 pages, so. <laughs> um, uh, the, the way, when transitioning from the Romer v. Evans to tra uh, Lawrence versus Texas, one of the things that I do mention is the suspect class. Uh, something also is the uh, tiered equal protection from Stone's footnote, because um, one of the things that um, in the United States versus Caroline Project uh, products, um, if a law neither burdens a fundamental right nor targets a suspect class, it will uphold the legislative classification so long as it bears rational relation to some legitimate end. And Justice Kennedy mm -hmm. found that the way that the law was established would create an undue burden 
um, on uh, discrete and insular minorities, just as Stone did, and of course, creating a suspect class. Of course, we don't want to do that. All right, I think we're running out of time, so we're going to end it there. Thank you all very much. <laughs>